Welcome to On The Metal, Tales from the Hardware Software Interface. I'm Brian Cantrell. With me, as always, is Jess Fursell. Hey, Jess. Hey, Brian. And we're joined by our boss, Steve Tuck. Hey, Steve. All right, Jess, you want to introduce who we've got in the garage with us today? Yeah, so today we have Ken Sheriff. I found out about him through Twitter, but it turns out that Brian and him already knew each other. But um, his Twitter feed is fascinating when it comes to, like, restoring old computers and stuff like that. I feel like I've learned a lot from it, so... Super excited. Well, it's great to be here. Yeah, Ken, it's great to have you in the garage. It's been a long time. And this is a literal garage. It, it is a literal garage, yes. Yeah, the, you are in a literal garage. Pretty good, uh, one in pretty good shape, actually. Yeah, very nice garage. So, Ken, you and I work together in what is now Facebook. But yeah, was build, build, you know, Building 17. And you are wearing your Sun Cluster jacket. Yeah, which I, I hold it up to the mic. Yeah, hold it up to the mic. All right. A lovely jacket that I understand your daughter has instructed you not to wear in public, but I'm glad that you have, you're going around the ban. Yeah, she's kind of forbidden me from wearing corporate logos outside, but I'm making a special case for this. Oh, so it's all corporate logos. It wasn't just a specific ban on, a, on any specific technology or company. It's all corporate logos. Well, good for her. Probably good taste, but I'm glad you wore the jacket. And so back in the day, you and I were working in the late 90s at Sun, and it was only years later that I read your blog and all the interest in retro computing. Were you always interested in retro computing even then? Um, not, not really. Back then, I was you know just focused on you know working at Sun, getting Sun Cluster working, fixing bugs. Uh, but you know now I've got more time to do the retro computing stuff, and I'm finding it very interesting doing my job to preserve history. But I see you've got a whole bin of you know old retro computing manuals and. I've never been in manuals, and I've always been interested in kind of these weird artifacts of of history and computing. But when I look at your blog, I've you know I've not really gone into any of this old actual physical hardware, and some of the things you found are just amazing. I mean, it was just the the Soyuz. I'm just reading recently because I would think it's probably your most recent blog post on the Soyuz clock, right? The and to describe that a little bit because that was stunning. So it's basically a digital clock that was mounted on the control panel of the Soyuz spacecraft in the 80s. Um, it has a clock, it has an alarm, it has a stopwatch. So a friend of mine um, bought one at an auction. We opened it up. I figured there'd be a clock chip inside, but instead... Right, you're thinking, like, how complicated is it going to be, right? Yeah, it's, and instead we open it up. It's got, like, 10 circuit boards. It's got over 100 chips inside. It's like, what on earth are they doing here? Is there, like, some, you know, super complicated technology... Is interfacing with the rest of the spacecraft, but after a bunch of analysis, it turns out it's really just you know the equivalent of a 1970s you know wristwatch digital watch. They use TTL chips. You know, doing it in the 80s seems kind of late for TTL, but you know, given the state of Russian technology was a little behind the U.S., that's what they used. And it just takes you know over a hundred chips to build a clock out of TTL chips. That is amazing. I mean, it must have been stunning for you to open this thing up, which is maybe like. Maybe two inches by three inches is what it looked like. Is that a, how big was this thing? Yeah, it, it's pretty small, but inside they have these very small TTL service mount chips. Everything was service mount flat packs and oh, they're all labeled in Cyrillic. So I had no idea what these chips were even doing. Okay. So you did not, you don't, you're not a native Russian speaker. No. Because honestly, you would not know it from reading that blog entry where you are like very confidently decoding all of the Cyrillic on these, on these packages. Oh, we're getting lots of feedback from Russian readers about things that, that I've done wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They, they they don't like any criticism of Russian technology. Oh, I don't think that uh, blog entry uh, to me was not, cr I think it was amazing what they were able to, the efficiency of kind of packing it in there given that they were behind the, it was not CMOS based. Yeah, the circuit boards, they're um, just two two-sided circuit boards, the wiring harnesses, it's all point-to-point -point wiring. It's all bundled up very nicely, laced into these, these wiring harnesses, connecting everything together. It's a real pain to trace out the circuitry because everything goes into a mystery wiring harness and pops out somewhere else. Oh, wow. So I spent a whole lot of time with a multimeter beeping things out. <laughs> I finally found a Russian data book that tells me what the chips are, and I've been cutting and pasting into Google Translate trying to understand it all. So the chips are all similar to 7400 series TTL chips, but some of them are quite different. They kind of took things in a different direction. 
that's interesting. And so, I mean, I find this like naturally, and just I think I speak for, I mean, you find this naturally captivating, right? I mean, this is just yeah. amazing. What kind of got you initially interested in taking apart some of these old things and understanding them? Because it was obviously sometime between the 90s and present day, you got very interested in this stuff. Well, you know, a lot of it goes back to when I was a child and I, I saw a punch card computer. I got a tour of it. And then later, I was actually writing some programs on punch cards. So, you know, I've got a soft spot in my heart for punch card computers, which has led me to a lot of stuff at the Computer History Museum. Hold on, you were writing software for a punch card computer. I mean, you're not that much older than I am. How how did that work? So so this was you know, when I was in about you know seventh grade, I was writing programs in Fortran. My dad managed to talk to the local university into letting me use their, their computer, and so I had a great time doing that. And, and What kind of computer was it? It was an Amdahl, I believe it was an IBM 370 clone. Wow. Oh, cool. That's what uh, Tom Lyon was one of our guests on on the metal did ported Unix to that machine. So that's a big machine to be playing with. Yeah, it was the computer center at the University of Manitoba. I'd punch a deck of cards on the key punch, and then I'd stand in line, hand them to the operator, operator would run them through. The, the printer would spew out output at high speed. You'd rip off your output, and then there's this huge recycling bin in the middle, and you'd throw all the bad stuff into this recycling bin in the middle, and Take your pick up your program on the other side and walk out with your listing, figure out what went wrong, walk over to the key punches, fix the bugs. And so this is your first experience program. This is your yeah. first computer, effectively, right? Yeah, basically. So what type of program does like a seven year old write right on <laughs> one of those? No, no, this was seventh grade. Was oh, more, seventh more, grade. Was, okay. A little more of a relief. But still, yeah. like I don't know what I'd do. Like so, so my biggest accomplishment was writing a calendar program that could you know, print out a calendar based on the month and year. Uh, that's pretty impressive, considering was it like Gregorian and had all the necessary modifications for the Gregorian calendar? Yeah, you know, I, I found the, the formula for working out the dates in, the, in a book, and you know, it's not too hard to write it in, in Fortran. You know, getting the format, getting the... You know, Fortran's not really good for you know, formatting output nicely, but I got it to work. That's great. Um, and what drove you for that in particular? So I just thought computers were, were really cool and I wanted to play around with them. And what my father told me that, you know, you're never going to get a job just doing computers. But, um, you know, it, it, it worked out for me. I, you know, it's funny because I, I wonder, certainly that's not something you hear now. I heard the same thing when I was a kid. You know, you can't just play on the computer for the rest of your life. Like, well, you can. maybe I can. <laughs> maybe I can. Yeah, he told me, you know, you have to use computers as part of something else, like being in a business where you're using computers or being a scientist where you use computers, but you can't just do computers for a career. Jess, this gets to one of your favorite lines from Halt and Catch Fire. Yeah, it's computers aren't the thing. They're the thing that gets you to the thing. Which I love. <laughs> How did you know that I would just be able to, like, say that? I, you know, I've been hanging out with you enough to know what your favorite lines are from Halt and Catch Fire. <laughs> No, it's like you said that a couple of times. I think it's a great line, you know, it's just in terms of like making the point that your father's making. Although what your father is not realizing that like actually it turns out you can make the thing that. Yeah, that they, I mean, that's kind of what we're doing. Yeah. So did you know at that age that you wanted to mess around with computers? Yeah, basically, you know, from that age on, I figured computers were what I wanted to do for a career. And you know, some people, it takes a long time for them to figure out. But I knew at a young age that computers were where it was for me. Yeah, it's a real luxury, right? To have that kind of, to, to have that drive. And so then it's like some gap between that and Sun when I know you. What kind of machines had you encountered along the way before before hitting Sun? Well, I, I built a, a Z80 computer, you know, S100 circuit boards plugged into a box when I was younger. It never, ever worked. I'm hoping, you know, now I probably have the skills to get it working. So that's on my list of things to do. Oh my God. Did you know where the physical machine is? I mean, do you have it still? No. Yeah, I have it. So, oh my God. You know, I have a 16K memory board that I soldered by hand, you know, dozens of chips onto this, this board. And wow. This is like a, this is like a Rosebud Orson Welles <laughs> kind of a thing that you're trying to get back to that childhood computer and get that actually working. And, and then finally I can, you know, my life will be complete or something. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's, that's pretty deep actually. <laughs> yeah, I'm amazed you still have this thing. Well, you know, my, my dad kept it in the garage for years, and finally he said, I'm cleaning out here, you take it. Right, there you go. Have you tried to get it working, or is that, uh, that's on the list? You, you gotta, it's on the list. I've got way too many things on the list. That's right. Well, you you got to get to that thing, like, last, you know. Yeah, like on my deathbed. Exactly. You it gotta, finally boots up and I keel over. <laughs> right. It's like, you know, Pelt Lighter said, it, I, he always lionized 
Leonard Euler because he said Leonard Euler died doing math. You heard the story, Jess? That the, uh. the so you know Euler is just yeah. ridiculously prolific, and Euler has got his great great grandson, I believe, on his lap. Calculates the orbit of Uranus, the recently discovered planet. He finished. He's blind at this point. He calculates the orbit. He realizes he's having a stroke, and he says, "I die." And what? he dies. What? what? Yeah, this is how this is how Euler goes. <laughs> And so Erdish would retell this story because he's like, that's the way to go out. Euler went out the way a mathematician should go out, like doing math, basically doing math up until the last conceivable second. He just loved this fact that Euler would say, I die. And there was some smart ass grad student who pointed out that another one of Euler's conjectures is proved to be true. It's a math joke. Oh, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, uh, you know, it's one of those. It's a little things. dark. It's a little exactly a little dark. Anyway, so you you have this machine that you built yourself. You never get it working, but you're still. It mu they must have enjoyed the journey, as they say. I, I learned a lot doing it, and shortly after, my dad bought a Commodore PET, which worked out go. of the box. So then oh, cool. I could actually write programs and stop soldering so much. <laughs> the Commodore PET has the C sixty four has come up on on the metal. But not the Commodore PET. And the Commodore PET is actually the first computer that I actually physically touched, I think. Well, I'm glad you brought up the Commodore PET. So did you, you had a, a, your own PET? Yeah. So I, I wrote a bunch of programs in that. I disassembled the ROM and spent a whole lot of time reverse engineering what the ROM did, how the basic interpreter worked. I figured out a lot of it, but there was still a lot that was beyond my, my comprehension. How old were you when you, when you had the PET? So that must in a desperate attempt to make myself feel better for not having disassembled the ROM or not having done really anything other than like played basic games. Um, must have been probably 13 at the time. I, I, I was definitely prepubescent. It makes me feel a little better. But Ed, that's great. So you had the pet reverse engineered effectively. Yeah. And I had, had a copy of the schematics. So I spent a lot oh, of time Jesus. trying to understand what the schematics did. The cassette state machine, I never quite figured out, but a lot of it I understood. That's cool. And do, what is the Commodore Pets role in history, if anything? I mean, it plays an outsized role for me because I had it in the school, but was it, was it actually a relevant machine? I mean, I don't really know that much about it. Well, it was you know, one of the very popular home computers. You basically had the, the Apple II, the Commodore Pet, the TRS-80, affectionately known as the Trash-80. The Trash-80, yeah. So, so the, these were the machines that really got the, the home computer out of the hobbyist soldering sort of market and into the people would actually just go and buy one. Right. So you're 13, you got the schematics for the Commodore PET, you got that thing reverse engineered. And then what's, what's next? What, what's the next machine? We're in the early eighties at this point, right? It's going to be like 83, 84, something like that. So went off to university of Waterloo for college. They had a bunch of computers there. Spent a lot of time doing stuff on IBM PCs, learning your know, real computer scientist skills. Right. Went, went to grad school. I worked on a, a lot of stuff there, on a, a lot of Spark Sunboxes there. Right. And so then we, you probably catch up to when you and I crossed paths, right? In the, in the late 90s, must have been. Yeah, when I, I went to Sun Labs, started working on a cluster operating system, turned into Sun Cluster, moved into becoming a product. I moved over to Building 17, where I encountered you. Right. <laughs> Little did we know, it's all going to be blown up later by a bunch of Facebookers, but you know, whatever. And then, so w then when does the retro computing interest really, so it's not then, but later you get really interested in these old machines. Well, a lot of it was when I saw the Visual 6502 online, oh, interesting. where they had reverse engineered the 6502 chip, the same chip that was in the Commodore PET. Nice. They had a JavaScript simulator. I looked at it, it's like, wow, this is really cool. All these flashing transistors and things, but I have no idea what's going on here. And it's kind of embarrassing for me being a computer scientist and having no idea what was really happening inside a chip. Yeah. So I started to look into the 6502 in more detail, understanding what's really going on at the transistor level. Um, that, that got me into looking at other chips. I, I bought myself a metallurgical microscope so I could open up my own chips and start oh, looking oh, inside. That's dope. Whoa, we wow. need one of those. Why I'll, don't we have I, one of those? This, that's, this, that's your, whenever someone's got some amazing piece of hardware, this is always the first thing you say. Why can't we have one of those? <laughs> it's like, can't Ken have his own thing? <laughs> like, it doesn't always have to be something that we don't have. But I, that said, like, we need to get one of those. That would be very cool. So what can you do with those? You decap them and... So, so you know, my... My microscope and decapping skills are, you know, way below someone like John McMaster. You know, I, I stick to chips that I can decap with a chisel, like ones in ceramic packages, ones with metal lids. I don't like messing around with boiling sulfuric acid. <laughs> but, but 
you basically, I, I you buy a chip on eBay, I tap it with a chisel, pop it open, put it under the microscope, oh, wow. take a bunch of pi- pictures, stitch it together, get a nice image of the chip, and then I sit down and try to figure out what's going on in the chip. Wow. So what are some of the chips that you've done this to? So um, right now I'm working on the AM2901, which Ooh. which is a 4-bit bit slice processor yes. that's very popular in the... 70s and 80s with um, a lot of mini computers. Could you please talk about the, this? This is the AMD 2900 series, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Could you talk about that a little bit? Because we had Jeff Rothschild on here and he was refer- talked about the AMD 2900 and I didn't recognize it when he talked about it. And then re- only afterwards, was putting to the show notes, I thought he was referring to the AMD 29000, which was an, a risk processor that came later. The 2900 is a bit sliced processor. And I, realized, I don't understand anything about these bit slice processors. So could you explain them a little bit? Well, well, they're kind of interesting technology that came into play when you could fit enough onto a chip to make part of a microprocessor, but not the whole microprocessor. <laughs> In particular, most of your microprocessors, like the 6502, used MOS transistors, later CMOS. In the 70s and 80s, that was sort of a slow, backwards technology. Bipolar TTL was the way to go for high-speed but bipolar transistors were too big to put a whole lot on a chip. So what they would do is make something like the AM2901 chip, which was 4-bit registers and ALU. But it was designed in such a way that you could combine a bunch of them together. So you combine them, make an 8-bit, 16, 32, 64-bit processor, whatever wow. you want, with enough chips. It's like a Lego kit to make your own That's microprocessor. So cool. That is cool. Someone should do that today. It's almost kind of like a risk 5 although different. So, so <laughs> well, like, it could be module. So, so the thing about these chips is they only had the, the ALU and the registers. They didn't have any of the control logic. So right, you, exactly. That's the, the way you have with RISC-V. That you're, it's like you're, you're missing a lot of the CPU, yeah. So, so you, would, you would buy an, a separate chip that would be a sequencer that would step through microcode. You'd um, have a microcode ROM, have a bit of glue logic, and then you'd build your, your processor out of a, a board of these chips. So could you buy different microcode that had like different control flow logic in it? I mean, it would... Well, basically you design it for whatever instruction set you want. Um, Back then, it was much easier for people to build their own computers, their own architecture, their own instruction set. You know, whatever you wanted in your computer, you would, you just design it that way. You weren't, you weren't locked into, you know, x86 or something. Wow. We think about people who complain about technology being hard to use. I mean, hey, at least you're not making your own microprocessor. I mean, that seems like that would be, that would require a lot of tooling to get up and running. Well, you know, the thing with TTL chips is you can just sort of you know, wire them together in a printed circuit board. It, it was quite common for people to design their own processors out of chips in that era. Right. You know, even video games, they'd be like, well, we want a processor for the video games. So let's just design our own processor. Right. So it's kind of a different world from now where there's a small number of processors. You go out and buy what you want. And the clock rates are lower, right? I mean, presumably it was clocked, the 2901? Yeah, so you, you'd, be, you'd be running at a, a few megahertz. Right. The 2901 that I'm looking at, it's actually an ECL, emitter coupled logic version inside, okay. which is a high-speed technology that they actually used on the Cray-1. Right, right, right. So, so it was supposed to be the wave of the future, but it is very hot. It uses a lot of power. So once low-power CMOS came out, it basically killed it off entirely. How much power are we talking about, actually, out of curiosity? So, so I don't know the numbers, but... Much more than CMOS. Yeah. Interesting. And so have you gotten this thing working? Um, remember, I'm taking these things apart. Oh, right, exactly. right. Excuse so, me. So, right. Let me right. <laughs> go back to where I was like <laughs> popping the cotton the top off with a chisel. Right. Yeah. So I start with a working chip, and by the time I'm done, it's entirely not working. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, though. And did you, how much did you know about these microprocessors going in? Did you even call this a microprocessor? Well, it's it's controversial, you know, what the definition of a microprocessor is. Right. I've actually written an article on that and have angry people saying, no, my chip is a microprocessor, you're entirely wrong. Oh, interesting. Generally, I, I view a microprocessor as being a whole CPU on a chip. Right. So something like the, the 8080. The 8080 or 4004, right. Is, uh, the, well, is the 4004 a microprocessor by that definition? So it, it is just barely. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, much as I'd like to rule it out, I couldn't find any reason not to call it a microprocessor. Interesting. Uh, yeah, when we had uh, Tom Lyon on, he actually referred us to uh, DataPoint. I did. You know oh, the, oh yes, I, I recently bought a DataPoint um, twenty two hundred that I, is also on my list of restoring. Oh yeah, I mean I had never heard of DataPoint, and now it's a very interesting kind of company. And the DataPoint folks believe that they are part of the reason for the forty oh four. Um, not not quite. 
Ah, okay. So, so the, Set the record straight. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a lot of interesting history there. First, the 4004 and the 8008 are entirely different chips. Right. Marketing makes them sound like the, it's just 4-bit and 8-bit version, but they're totally different. So the, the history of the 8008 is um, Datapoint built this desktop computer out of TTL chips. They were talking to their supplier at Intel and said, would you be able to put this all on one chip? And the guy at Intel said, yeah, sure, I think we could do that. And so Intel went off and basically spent a year doing nothing. And Datapoint also talked to their TI supplier and said, could you put this all on a, a chip and make a you know, processor on a chip? And so TI eventually built a chip. Intel also built a chip, which was the 8008. And so the TI's chip um, never really caught on anywhere. Datapoint decided that the 8008 was too late for them, so they built a, a different TTL version of their processor. Interesting. Intel had this chip, and it's like, well, I guess we should just, you know, sell it as a as a product. So they turned it into a, a microprocessor product, and it was really a clone of the Datapoint 2200 processor. Oh, interesting. So I- Intel doesn't like to um, you know, acknowledge. Show, agno- acknowledge this. Right, exactly. But the 8008 turned into the 8080. That led to the x86. So basically, <laughs> most of the desktop computers today have their, their roots, their instruction set coming from this mostly forgotten data point 2200 desktop computer and so that, da- data point was not using them as a contractor it no it's like hey if you could go build this for me we might use it to intel yeah, yeah ba- basically and you know the problem was it was low priority for intel and by the time they were done with the chip data point could do things faster with improved ttl chips like the 74 181 alu chip so they're like thanks but no thanks and meanwhile, Intel finds a use for this thing in the broader market. Yeah, they get to keep the it's IP. It's a pretty great and, story. And the, the data point folks claim that that was the first instance of a register. That I found kind of suspicious. Is that true, do you think? Well, I guess it depends how you define registers. Ah, there but, you go. you know, all the IBM computers in the 1950s I had registers. Had registers. Well, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. Pull, pull out your 7090 manual from the... Right, right. right. they all had registers. And yeah. I'm not sure why they, they... But apparently the naming of the registers did come from the AX, BX, CX, DX. Yeah, so they had the A, B, C, D, E, H, L registers, which those names are still... Still with us. Still with us. Yeah, albeit having been extended many times over. That's a very interesting history. So you've got a 2200. Yeah. And that's great. And you're going to get that thing... Does it work? No. Um, no. We know it's not going to work when you're done with it, but it's like... <laughs> well, well th- that's what I'm trying to move it in the moving towards working rather than away from working. <laughs> got it. But, but um, one other interesting thing about the data point processor is it was a serial processor. It operated on one bit at a time, which made it very slow. Right. And so that's basically why the x86 is little endian. Oh, really? Be- because if you're, if you're operating on one bit at a time, you, you have to start at the lowest bit of the lowest word and work your way through. And so that ended up putting the low order byte before the high order byte in memory and so when oh my god when they built the 808 they copied this architecture and so that's still with us today i mean the indianness wars are in such the distant past but you can see why man if you built a big indian machine he was something like are you kidding me like little indian makes no sense at all steve i'm, I'm gonna assume i think it's a fair assumption that do you know what little indian and big no indian mean? no before that i was just gonna all ask right, yeah. so did, did they it was serial in architecture because that was the only choice at the time well, it basically that saved you a lot on hardware because you only had to build a one-bit ALU. You built a one-bit data bus, and you just shoved each bit through one at a time. Right, so you have one so pin cost coming efficiency. out. Package efficiency as much as anything, right, I would assume? Or? Well, package efficiency, cost efficiency. Remember, they were building this out of individual TTL chips, so it meant right. they could use you know, one chip instead of eight chips for each part of their, mm. their bus. All right, so Steve, I feel you need an explanation of Little Endian versus Big Endian. Definitely. All right, and you want to... Um, no, I'm probably going to get backwards. So. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely, <laughs> damn it, I was hoping I could trick you into doing that, because I'm definitely going to get backwards. So when you look at a word in memory, the question is, where is the most significant bit of that? Is the most significant bit at the high order bit, or is it at the low order bit? And when you actually look at a word in memory, it's much more intuitive if it is Big Endian. So if the high order bit is the lowest bit in memory of a 32-bit word. And Little Endian has that reversed, right? I think I've got it. Or the opposite. Right. No, so when you look at, no, when you, but when you look at a raw dump on x86, it's being interpreted Little Endian, you've got to reverse everything in your mind. 
It's actually mm. a real pain in the ass to look at Little Onion. So if you have the hex number one, two, three, four, do you store that as one, two, and then three, four? Or do you store that as three, four, and then one, two? Yeah. But it, it's um, not nearly as annoying as the Xerox Alto where everything was in octal. So, so if, you've, if you've got two ASCII characters in your 16-bit word and you're displayed in octal, they're like broken not on a character boundary. It's, it's impossible to figure out what's going on. Wow. And so in, in you, because you're trying to restore an Alto now, right? Is that, I, did I read that correctly? Yeah, we got the Alto working a year or so ago. Oh, wow. Okay. And so we got a lot of the software running on it. We got the original WYSIWYG text editor running on it. Wow. And it's interesting to see in the Alto is the, it's basically the first machine that was using a GUI, Windows, mouse. The laser printer was invented for the Xerox Alto. That's right. Yeah. And it's interesting to see how they were developing things like scroll bars you know, everybody wrote a totally different scroll wall bar for their program. And that's like Charles Simonier is down there working on that at that time, right? Yeah. So then he left, he went to Microsoft right. and, and wrote Word there, taking a lot of ideas from the, the WYSIWYG editor they developed and uh, what called the, Bravo. Bravo, that's right. I, I couldn't, the, yeah. Interesting. So you got Bravo work? Yeah. Wow. And it's, it's a combination of surprisingly powerful for that time right. and extremely clunky. Right. It has a lot of modal things, so it's like using VI, that you're always in the wrong mode. Oh, interesting. But you had all your, your bold text, font sizes, all that appeared nicely on the screen. One bizarre thing is you could use this to write your code. So your code could be written with you know, centered text, bold text, different fonts. Oh and, my God, what a terrible idea. The compiler would just you know, compile it anyway. Oh, I know it feels like a good idea, but it's a terrible idea. I mean, I know, okay, look, I know that I'm out of, do you use syntax highlighting when you write code? I know this makes me a fossil. I, I, I use it just because the editor does it by default and I'm too lazy to turn it off. Yeah, I, I, I make sure that my editor knows that I want to be treated just like VI. I really do not want, I know Jess, I know, I know. I know. No, I know people that do that. There are people on the Go team that did that. I just, syntax, I, I don't need syntax highlighting when I read a book. Like why do, if I need syntax highlighting when I'm reading a program, it just feels like something. I know I'm, I'm very out of step here. It's me. But, well, well, I find it amazing things like 80 column text that people are using now have their, their roots back in the days of punch cards. Okay. So, but where does that come from? This is so good. This does get to a bit of a hot button for me because this is actually a golden ratio issue more than anything else to me. So if you were to take it, all right, well, I'm sorry. Where does the 80 columns from a punch card come from? So it, it goes back to the 1890 census when they in, invented punch cards because they couldn't process the census data otherwise. Okay. Yeah. Then in the 1920s, IBM discovered they could fit more data onto a punch card if they used rectangular holes. And it turns out that 80 columns was what they could fit on the, on the size of the punch cards, mm. which the size of the punch card was based on the old size of the U.S. dollar. Oh. Because they had bins shaped to handle cards of that size. But no, this is to my point. It's a golden ratio thing. It's like, why is the dollar shaped the way the dollar is shaped? It's a golden ratio. And so here's my, my belief. Because if you take any book written at any time and open it up to any page and you count the number of characters in a line, you get between 65 and 75 characters. It's like uh, we, yeah. we don't like to, we don't read lines that have got 150 characters in them. Look, I'm an 80 column purist. Okay. I have to like make history fit my belief. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then there's, there's line printers, which used 132 columns. So that kind of ruins your I, theory. I, I reject those. I reject, <laughs> no, no, I am, I am, um, I am sure at the time there were people that objected to those line printers as having columns that were too wide. I think it's too cognitively wide. It's like, why, uh, why 132? Why not 1,320? Okay, that's way too long. Oh, oh, that's too long. Oh, okay. Well, well and, and clearly there is some width that is too, anyway. You know what? But, but it just amazes me that this decision to use 80 columns on a card that grew out of you know, 1920s technology, people are still using 80 columns on their, on their code today just for historical reasons. <sighs> and, and then there, it's not historical reasons, it's cognitive reasons. And then there's, there's 72 columns that some people use, which is because on the original IBM computers that they wrote Fortran on, it was a 36-bit machine. It read two 36-bit words from a card so it could only read 72 columns of the 80-column card. Okay, I'm not a 72-column person, okay? So like that, I feel, I, I'm now I'm feeling less like antiquated. 
But <laughs> Jess is giving me a look like, same difference. <laughs> I mean, there's eight characters different. <laughs> Hang on, it could be 88. <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay, I'm not going to get you started on tabs versus spaces. No, actually, I feel, you know what? I actually, honestly, tabs versus spaces. I'll, also, it has been great on the podcast hearing about like the Teletype 33 and appreciating the like efficiency argument for tabs versus spaces, which I yes. never really appreciated. Tabs versus spaces is less important to me than, than 80 columns, actually. Wow. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> I just feel like if you're going to die on one of those hills, you I'm die on both. Hill. No, I'm definitely or... dying on 80 columns. Hill. Jess is just like, I started a company with you. Like, I have, <laughs> I have shackled my future to, the, to a crazy person. Yeah. Well, I definitely like, I would not go above 100. But there are some times where I just don't want to cut it off in the middle of a word. I know, but then you like you reformat so it can fit within the eighty columns that I, I God or the eighteen ninety census as it turns I out. I definitely intended. do that. So like I start out with a file and it's in eighty columns. But then if it's like markdown and then I want to add some words in, then it's like I don't want to have to reformat the whole file to add like an okay. and. So that's where you got to get like GQ. The Vim can reformat that for you. Vim but then your is diff accommodating. versus being just okay. the and is this whole huge diff. That is true. That is true. That is undeniable. Okay. And if that is the only condition under which you go to the hundredth column, I honor it. I also question that. I, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a part of the good history. No, I, I do. The, it's a cognitive load thing for me. And okay. I, I, you That's know, fair. It, it, it's, I know. I'm sorry, Ken. You're wondering like, what the hell did I wander into? I think I've wandered into like some sort of dispute. Well, the other approach is to avoid columns altogether. I've been using an analog computer where everything is wired up using a patch panel. Oh, there we go. It's like literal spaghetti code by the time you've got wires everywhere. Oh, <laughs> okay. We got to take a quick break. I want to hear more about this. We'll be back with more from Ken Sheriff on the metal. On the metal is brought to you by the Oxide Computer Company, where we're going to try a new feature shamelessly ripped off of Reply All's Yes, Yes, No, where our boss, Steve Tuck, brings us a tweet we, he does not understand. And Jess and I try to explain it to him. Steve, do you have a tweet? I sure do. Go the for it. The tweet in question, UEFI preboot network stack engaged the onboard NIC in such a way that it would write back BMA to particular physical memory pages sometime after control was passed to the bootloader. Corruption would occur somewhere in the user parts of the RAM disk. No idea. No idea. Jess, do you understand this tweet? So I understand definitely the part about the UEFI preboot networking stack, but... The part about DMA is in question marks. So it's like, I guess you're not really sure where that's you're going. You're overthinking it. I understand this tweet. Running on-prem is painful. This is dealing with an <laughs> awful, awful firmware bug. The firmware has overwritten part of the operating system in a way that is extremely painful to debug. So who do you go to in that case? Who do you go to? You definitely strangle one of your vendors. You strangle one of your vendors. And unfortunately, your vendor is a PC vendor because all of the existing <laughs> computer companies are selling personal computers. What we need is a new computer company. So this is just saying I'm an intense pain trying to run systems on premises. That's exactly what it's saying. Steve, what can someone do if they're intense pain running on premises? Well, if someone is running in intense pain on premises, what they should do is go over to oxide.computer to learn a little bit more about how we are gonna take that pain away. Help is on the way. Join us at oxide.computer. You are not alone. All right, we're back. Ken, I want to hear about this analog computer in the patch panel. So a friend of mine got an analog computer from an auction. What year are we talking? This one's 1969. Who is making an analog computer in 1969? So it turns out analog computers are actually not the hideous backwards things you would think of at this point. <laughs> but, you know, at that time period, analog computers, they could calculate differential equations oh, essentially okay. instantaneously. Huh. A digital computer would be like turning away for like a few minutes to you know step through a differential equation. So they, they give you a lot more speed. You could interact with them. They they were good for real time things, flight simulators. Oh, interesting. Because you know that there were analog computer dead enders in like nineteen sixty nine. Like, let's see your digital computer do this. And, and, and they were doing different. I mean, that's amazing. So when was that no longer the case? When could a digital computer beat an analog computer? Yeah, well, a lot of it was application specific. Okay. You know, up through the 70s, you know, analog computers still held on in, in some places. Wow. But, you know, once a digital computer could do things faster than an analog <laughs> computer, yeah. it, it was way more accurate. You know, the thing with an analog computer is you have voltages representing all your values. You have op amps to add things up. You have capacitors doing integration. 
Oh my God. So it's all electronic components that you're basically wiring up by plugging wires into a patch panel, kind of like an old modular synthesizer. I am feeling shortness of breath thinking of this. If you've dealt with analog, it's a terrible, terrible world. It seems analog. cool though. So, so, oh my God. so the computer is full of these like very high precision components. Like normally electronics uses 10% tolerance resistors, 5% accurate right. resistors. These are 0.01% accurate. Right. And a bad resistor oh, or a bad right. capacitor means like wrong answer. Because in an analog computer, your value, your results depend on the accuracy of the components. If you want to be like within 0.01% accurate, your components all have to be that accurate. Okay, that's terrible. Yeah, go debug that. So, so that, that's like one of the huge advantages of digital computers. Your components can be pretty inaccurate. They just have to be able to tell a zero from a one. But by mm. stringing enough bits together, you can get as much accuracy as you want. And if a digital computer doesn't work, it doesn't work, as opposed to giving you the wrong answer. Well, you know, back in, okay, the, back in right. the old asterisk, days. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Yes, okay. <laughs> it's kind of funny. On IBM scientific computers, they didn't really have any error checking. They figured scientists were smart enough to notice if the answer came out <laughs> wrong. But their business computers, they were just crammed full of error checking. There was parity checking everywhere. Their printer had like four different types of checking to make sure that it was printing the right character. Because in a oh. business environment, if you're printing out checks and it accidentally prints a nine where there shouldn't be a nine, this is costing the you real, real consequences. money. Wow, that's really interesting. So all of the reliability came up on the commercial side. Yeah, because that's where it was important and people were willing to pay for it. So what were some of the first machines to begin to have error correcting codes? Or was that very early? So that, that went back very early. Okay. It, it's amazing reading old stuff, just how worried they were about reliability. That, you know, if your component's going to fail after a thousand hours and you have 10,000 components, you're only going to get a few minutes of, of work out of your computer. And so there was like a lot of research into how to, how to build things reliable, how to have like multiple things running in parallel. And then it turns out they could just build components reliable enough that you don't need to worry anymore. Yeah, right. Nowadays, your computers have you know, billions of transistors, and you just don't worry about them failing. Well, we worry <laughs> about them failing. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, the well, especially as the, as the as the speeds get so high, I mean, it, you do actually need a lot. But it's the underlying transistors are much more reliable. Certainly, we still I definitely need. Well, you were around at Sun for the eCash parody. Era. Oh yeah, <laughs> that that was just a, a nightmare. Oh yeah, and the I mean, there were so many. That was the we were, there were a lot of problems with that. Turns out having radioactive boron in your SRAM cell is a very bad idea. Uh, but it's interesting, so th this analog machine, do you guys actually get it, did you get that working? So unfortunately, it didn't come with any documentation. Oh, no. So I've been reading all these, like, old books from the 1960s on analog computers, and I've also been tracing out the circuitry, trying to understand how it works. And so I've implemented some simple, simple differential equations. I managed to get a nice sine wave out of a second order differential equation. Oh my God. The, the weird thing about analog computers is that differential equations are really what they're designed to do. With a capacitor and an op amp, integration is pretty much trivial. So you just do a few layers of integration, wire the results back in, and boom, it solves your differential equation as fast as you can watch. Are you finding it like programmable? Are you finding it like relatively easy to program? That seems, I mean, this honestly, the closest I've come to crying while working on an assignment was my A to D lab in school. I thought I was going to break down. I mean, I had a bad bypass cap and I thought I was going to weep. So we're still, still just getting very limited stuff out of this. You know, it's a whole different world trying to do stuff with analog computers. And so, so uh, Mark, the guy I'm working with wants to build like a flight simulator out of it. And I'm like, how about if we just make a sine wave? Yeah, so, right. <laughs> right. It sounds like, yeah, it sounds like Mark may be a bad influence <laughs> or a good influence, I guess, depending on your perspective. But, but it's interesting looking inside this because each op amp is a whole circuit board. Uh, this was the era where they wow. where you, they had an op amp on a chip, but it was just not accurate enough. Is it a transistor-based op amp, though, in 1969? Well, it's an integrated circuit with, okay. with, with, that's an op amp, but okay. it didn't, didn't have the characteristics they want. So they put the op amp chip on a board, and they have a whole bunch of other stuff on the board to get the op amp to work accurately enough. Wow. So they have this chopper where they like chop the signals at 400 hertz. They send part of it through the op amp, part of it through a different amplifier, and then, then they merge the signals together, and this solves most of the problems that, that op amps had back in those days. And do you have schematics for this thing, or are you figuring all of this out? So, yeah, no documentation. So I've had to like stare at the circuit board and trace it out and try to figure out what's going on. It's a lot of time with a scope, I assume. So, yeah, I've... I've got a lot of patience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's otherworldly. That, that, that's amazing. 
And you found this at auction. What was the machine used for? Any idea where it came from? So this was made by a company called Simulators Incorporated, which is one of the more obscure analog computer vendors. Um, as, I mean, pretty, as opposed to your household <laughs> well, <no>. analog <laughs> computer vendors. Well, e even among you know analog computer vendors, they were an obscure one. EAI was one of the big names. EAI, okay. So this computer was used at the University of Alberta in Canada, probably for education, maybe for some you know unlucky grad students project. Right. And so they finally got sold off and. And, and, and now you, we have yours it. is in working enough condition, it sounds like. I mean, it sounds like with the... the well, there are, there are a few bad parts we had to replace. And some of the components don't seem to have quite the advertised accuracy, you know, 40 years later. Wow, that is really interesting. And so are, are you're in the objective, are you actually going to follow Mark on this flight simulator? Or are you going to stop at the sine wave? So we'll probably go a little beyond the sine wave, but Mark should probably be stopped from his full plan of, you know, imp implementing Apollo on this machine. Oh, because, really? It, well, it doesn't have enough op amps for one. So he's like, well, let's make more op amp boards and plug them in. I'm like, that's a crazy idea. <laughs> well, you know, I guess everyone needs a friend that's going to get them into some amount of trouble, yeah, but like cool. not too much trouble. So probably my goal with the analog computer is to build the Lorenz oscillator, which is a chaotic system. Right. And so that gives you a really nice chaotic display on your oscilloscope. Yeah, that'll be fun to watch. And so that looks like it's within the capabilities of this analog computer and the capabilities of me to like plug in a whole bunch of wires into a plug panel without getting one of them wrong. And in doing this, do you become a more of a digital person in using this thing? Do you feel like these, these machines are misunderstood and they should have been used for more? Or are you just like, I mean, I would just be questioning my life choices doing this thing. <laughs> well, I'm quite happy to be using digital computers now, but it, it does give me more appreciation for them. But before I looked at it, I thought that analog computers were just sort of this pointless dead end that people did for no good reason in the 60s. Right. But now I understand that there were good reasons to use them for a lot of applications. And it was actually a very useful, important dead end. Yeah. Right. And it would be interesting to know when the last analog machine was made. But obviously, they fell out, as you said, in the 70s. One of the other things that you did that I was really interested by is you took apart some of the cryptocurrency protocols, I think the Bitcoin protocol, did you, did you have a 1401 mining cryptocurrency? Did I read that correctly? Um, yes. And that was a lot more speed than when I tried mining it by hand. Oh, wait. So, so I, I, you, you should check out my, my video. Is, it, is this one of Mark's ideas? No, this was my own idea. Okay, all right. <laughs> so I figured that the hash algorithm used by Bitcoin, the best way to understand it would be to just try mining by hand. And it turns out that it's pretty simple bit operations. And so you can just... You can just sit there with a piece of paper and go through the mining operations, you know, doing the XORs, doing the N. Of, of course, it would take me more than a day to just do one hash. Right. And so it'd take, you know, way longer than the age of the universe to actually mine a Bitcoin by hand. But it was a fun project. Was it educational? It was very educational. And so I put the video on YouTube and I expected that maybe a dozen people would want to see this, but it turned out to be surprisingly popular. Oh, people watch these like unboxing videos of like people unboxing like toys or whatever, and there'll be like 6 million views on it. So I think people <laughs> will... I like 60 million. Yeah, or like 60 million, exactly. I think, yeah, people would be, would be into it, I imagine. It must be mesmerizing. How long is your video? It's about 15 minutes. I, I, I fast forward through a lot of it. <laughs> Wow. How long did you spend mining by hand? I forget the exact time. I think it was about an hour to, to just do one cycle of the hash algorithm. A lot of people say they're extraordinarily patient. I think you may be in a different tier of extraordinary <laughs> patience. I, you know, you know, like, you know, Alex Honnold, the, the climber, like he actually submitted to an MRI and they discovered that like he's missing the fear center of his brain. Like it's like he doesn't have fear. Is it possible you don't have impatience? So I got an MRI once and they said everything looked normal. <laughs> were they aware that you have mined cryptocurrency by hand? I mean, maybe you should have given them some more detail. They would have yeah, to look for some things. They should have looked for the cryptocurrency center in the brain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they would have been like, it's all dead. Jess, how many views do you think his YouTube video got? Mining cryptocurrency with a pen or pencil and paper. A lot. I mean, just thousands. ballpark. It is more thousand, than thousands. A hundred thousand. What do you think? I think the like the most seen video I've ever done was like 170,000. So I'm going to say it's more than 170,000. I think it's going to be... That Brendan screaming at the discs was like a million. Yeah, believe it or not. That's that's a very popular video. It is. YouTube screaming was, in the data center. I know. YouTube was convinced that I was some like masterful content creator after that thing. and kept like trying to wanting me to participate in revenue sharing programs. I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. Like, that's the only one I got. <laughs> 1, 1. 1.2 million. That's a lot. Whoa. <laughs> that is a Whoa. lot. Whoa. That's nuts. <laughs> well, because the cryptocurrency community is huge and they're like, probably. I don't know. Yeah, that's a lot.
What are the comments like on that thing? YouTube comments are bad. Oh, they're terrible. I, I don't even read the comments on that video. Yeah, never read the comments. Yeah, like, listen, even the world's most patient man doesn't read the YouTube comments. That yeah. is like, I've got the patience to mine cryptocurrency by hand, not read YouTube comments. So, so yeah, I also implemented Bitcoin mining on the IBM 1401 punch card computer, which was surprisingly inconvenient because it's a decimal computer. It's doing decimal arithmetic, which is really not a good match for the binary operations in Bitcoin mining. Right. So that must have been hard. Yeah. How did you get that? In, in, so are they, you doing it in, what are you implementing it in? Assembly language. Assembly language. Okay. And then I'm punching in a whole bunch of punch cards and running it through. And the console lights flash in a really dramatic way when it's mining. Oh, nice. And then I also did uh, mining on the Xerox Alto, which was pretty pretty fast compared to the doing it by hand and the Apollo <laughs> pretty fast <laughs> compared to that's that's our yeah that's good this no, this and, computer's fast and and also the compared to doing it by hand and also the Apollo guidance computer oh, oh wow okay nice. you know we we got an Apollo guidance computer the computer that was used to land on the moon and I figured what to do with this well mine bitcoin mine bitcoin <laughs> yeah and were you doing it in an era that was early enough that you could actually like reasonably mine well, since Bitcoin didn't exist back then. You're yeah, right, of course. Oh, yeah, right, of course. But it shows that, you know, the technology, you know, theoretically was there for people doing, could have been doing Bitcoin mining. You might wonder about using a punch card computer, but even in the 1960s, IBM had networking. They, they connected 1401s together. It was basically oh, really? used for wow. the, the, the first computer communication by satellite. So theoretically, you could have had bunch of computers mining Bitcoin and connected by satellite in the 60s. Wow. I was introduced to the 1401. I mean, I obviously heard of the 1401, a very important computer. Right? Because it's IBM's real first, I guess the 650 is their first commercial computer, but the 1401 is the first one that goes really mainstream. Is that right? Well, the thing about the 1401 is it was a very, very low-end computer. It was designed to rent for $2,500 a month. So it really opened up the computer market to medium-sized businesses instead, instead of computers being something that only like giant companies or the government had, they ended up with, you know, over 10,000 1401s. So it really made the computer more of a widespread democratic thing rather than a, a giant room filling government owned thing. That's interesting. I first it kind of was exposed to the 1401 in my career when talking to a bank right after the Y2K, right after Y2K and a, According to them, anyway, 45% of their Y2K problems were from the 1401. So apparently the 1401 does not have a way to represent years in the 21st century. Well, I, I don't think they could blame the 1401 on you know, what's happening in Y2K directly. But the thing is that when you're putting your data on a punch card, you've only got 80 columns for all your data. So you need to have, you know, depending on application, you'd have employee number, you'd have your dollar amount, you'd have all this information. And it's hard to cram everything into eight, just 80 columns. Oh, interesting. So you think that was an 80 column limitation? And you're not just saying that to like side with Jess on this. I mean, it's like you can, you don't have to do that. No. Okay. <laughs> but but you, you would try to make your data as compact as possible. So huh. if you could use a two column date rather than a four column date, you're going to put two column date on your, on your card. And you know, back in 1960, why would you possibly care about being out of the 1900s? The, the, right. Well, and I think that you would not imagine that the software would outlive the hardware. I think that would be an idea that would be incredibly foreign in the 60s. Oh, yeah, that's super weird. Which now is like we Normal. totally accept, yeah. So the machines that you look at and restore, one question I definitely wonder is like, what is the oldest computer in production? So, you know, you get into a lot of issues of trying to get like, what's the oldest? I believe they've restored a Colossus from World War II in England. Oh, wow. But that was basically rebuilt from, right, from right. scratch because they destroyed the whole Colossus code-breaking computer for security reasons. Oh, interesting. So it's it's more of a more of a replica than. A, but do you think that, I mean? There, do you think there are still IBM 360s running in production somewhere that are actually doing useful things? There can't be, right? So I know of a company that is using a punch card accounting machine, a pre-computer machine for their business. Wow. Are they aware of what happened since then? 
Yeah, the Computer History Museum has tried to talk them into giving their computer to the Computer <laughs> History Museum, and the Computer History Museum will give them like a you know modern desktop computer. But right, they don't want it. But the owner is like, everything works fine the way it is. Why should we change? Wow. So literally, the Computer History Museum is like, yeah, the Computer History Museum won't leave me alone. They want our our IT infrastructure. Yeah. So there's this whole world of accounting machines that existed before modern digital computers that companies would use. They put their data on punch cards. The accounting machine has electromechanical counters that would add stuff up. So you would end up running your data through. It would print it out on paper, print out sums, so you could print up, you know, count up your totals for department or whatever. And this was all like electromechanical before they were even using vacuum tubes. Wow. So these are in like the 20s and 30s? I mean, is it that early? So... Back in the 1890 census, they had basic simple counting machines, and right. then it developed from there more advanced things. The counting machines got pretty advanced. You could count up totals, subtotals, sub-subtotals. You could do multiplication if you worked really hard at it. So have you played around with these machines? Have you, have you tried to get a hold of one of these counting machines? I've seen them, but I've never actually programmed one myself. That's cool. Yeah, that's... So, so, so the programming was all done yeah, by... Yeah, programming? Plug, right. Programming was all plug boards. Plug board, okay, yeah. So basically, you'd connect your wire for card column one goes into this counter, card column two goes into this counter, the output from this counter goes onto printer column four, output from this goes onto printer column six. So this goes back to the, if you're doing dates, you're not going to want to connect four wires and use four right. columns when you could just use two wires and have two-digit dates. This is not a stored program computer in any fashion well the plug board is removable so you can store it on a shelf and this is what companies would do they would actually have shelves with like dozens of program boards so you want to do your taxes you pull the tax program board off the shelf you stick it onto your computer you want to do inventory you pull the inventory board off the shelf stick it onto your computer so you'd actually have a library of programs in these physical boards with wires plugged into them wow. stifle yeah, right. Have you run across any of these? So, so yeah, a, a friend of mine had one of these plug boards, and so I reverse engineered the, the program on it to figure out how they were doing their taxes using this, this plug board. Oh, interesting. You know, the boards are just crammed with wires, like wires sort of plugged as densely as you can, so you can imagine. I mean, when you're doing this, I mean, have you, 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 you've gone through so many different kinds of machines. You must develop an aesthetic for things of like, right, this is like clever, this is not clever. I mean, what, are, there, are there some historical machines that you think are particularly meriting of kind of study because they do things that are, that are interesting or novel? Well, you know, I, I found that pretty much every computer has its own clever things. Every chip has its own surprises in it. You know, I, I generally start with the assumption that the people who built this knew what they were doing and it's up to me to figure out what it is. Wow, what a what a great assumption! I feel like that's not an assumption we often have when we pull software down over the internet. It's like it's definitely not an assumption that people knew what they were doing. I mean, it, it's very easy when you're looking at old computers to think, "Oh, this is so primitive. Why were the people doing such stupid things?" But it turns out that they were really pretty much doing clever things. They were doing the best they could with the technology they had available, and it's interesting to see how they were able to solve very complex problems with things like electromechanical counting wheels. Yeah, that is such a charitable view to have, I have to say. I mean, that must be... But, like, when did that die? Because, like, I, I feel like <laughs> just when you buy a computer today, I'm not, like... If I was to buy a computer today, I wouldn't be, like, oh, I really, like, These people cherish, are you, you right. know? These just, people like, are the doing... thought that they put into this. <laughs> it's more like, who do I tell that this thing is broken? Yeah, when did we when did we lose that? Was it when we invented firmware? Is that when we lost it? <laughs> Well, I, you know, I think it's a combination of, of good things and bad things in every system. And I try to look at the good parts and not so much the bad parts. That's fair. I mean, I mean, you know, old IBM computers, it's interesting because there's some things where they pushed the technology as far as they could to be innovative. And there's other things where they just kept old technology and really didn't innovate it. Right. And so you'd end up with an old key punch keyboard would end up being used in the IBM 360 console, even though it made no sense. It's just they had this. That was what it was around. That, that was what what was around. And so it had all these electromechanical things inside that were designed for punching cards. And they would end up still having that, even though there was like no point in it. 
still still working that way. And there are so many of these things that they tried really hard to get working and they were just at the limit of the physics. Like you, didn't you do something on phosphor based memory where you're actually using like a cathode ray tube for actual memory? So yeah, I haven't used those personally, but I know people who have um, way back in the day. So it turns out that memory was really the hard part of early computers. That building a ALU, building control circuitry, that's pretty straightforward, but building memory, that's hard. So you'd end up with things like mercury delay lines where you'd send sound pulses through a, a tube of mercury and then get the sound pulses out the other end and you could store your few thousand bits that way. Um, that had a lot of obvious disadvantages. <laughs> right, toxicity. Toxicity, um, your data was all serial, that if you wanted data, you had to wait for the data to come out the other end of the tube. Right. So this was rapidly replaced in the, in the 1950s with the CRTs called Williams tubes, right. where you'd basically put spots of, you'd put like a dot for a zero and a dash for a one on the screen, and you could ex electrostatically read the data out. Which just seems bonkers. So when you look at something like that, at that time, I guess that feels like a viable path, but it seems like in, how is that ever going to scale? Well, it, it, it worked. There were, IBM used that in their 701 computers. All the IAS computers used that. Right. People I know who worked with it said it was like very unreliable. You constantly had to be tweaking things. You'd have problems where if you, if you're writing one bit a lot, it, it could start influencing the bit next to it on the screen, which is exactly like Rohammer today with your DRAMs. Right, right. Monitor hammer, CRT hammer. <laughs> I mean, it, it, when did we decide that Williams tubes were not going to actually work out? It must have been shortly thereafter. So in the, in the mid-50s, when core memory came along, like literal cores, little donuts that could be magnetized one way or the other for zero or one. Right. When that came along, that sort of crushed all the previous technologies. And it was fast. It was relatively inexpensive. You know, you could get down to like one cent per bit, which was inexpensive for the time. You could store megabytes of data if you had like a room full of cabinets. So core memory, magnetic cores, they turned out to be a dominant technology up until the 70s when MOS memory came along and and won out. And core memory, of course, still with us in the form of a core dump, core dump right? D dates from core memory, right? Exactly. And core memory, is it core memory still used in space applications? So the space shuttle used core memory. Okay. But I think it is now entirely obsolete. It's entirely obsolete. Because it also had that advantage of being non-volatile, of course. Yeah, it's kind of interesting with the 1401 that you can turn on the computer and your program is there. You push the power button, it goes chunk, chunk, chunk as these relays activate the power and you're ready to go. Because of, of the core memory. As oh, opposed wow. to a modern computer where you like boot it up and you know, a minute later it's it's ready to go. It seems like we've gone backwards as far as the startup time. Well, we keep waiting for non-volatility to actually have the economics of DRAM. And there have been a couple, I mean, we've talked about phase change memory, and we've talked about on carbon nanotube based memory. It feels like one of these at some point. You know, well, flash memory has finally, you know, largely killed off the, the hard disk. So. Oh, contraire. <laughs> no, the hard disk is alive and well. It, it is just... It, the hard disk is alive and well, and it's just, it is at much larger volumes. Have you taken apart a hard disk at all? Have you, have you messed around with the modern hard disks? Uh, well, modern is in like Helium. 20 years ago. Oh yeah. So no, the, the drive technology has, I'm going to sound like a paid shell for WD <laughs> or Seagate, but with Helium drives and now with what's called hammer and memory, heat assisted magnetic recording and microwave assisted magnetic recording, they are continuing the drive densities up in a way that you cannot get with flash. The density is much, 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 much higher. So I would say that's going to be alive and well. I think the spindle is going to be with us for a long time to come. So, so at the Computer History Museum, they have a RAMAC, which right, was yeah. IBM's first disk storage. And it's quite a remarkable thing. It's about a six foot high stack of disks. The disks are on a couple feet wide. It actually has an air compressor providing the air to keep the heads floating above the disk surface. Well, right. right. It's amazing. And the, the seek time is awful because it's like these hydraulic arms that go chunk, 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 and they'll move the head from like <laughs> one disc platter to another. It's so, amazing that it worked at all. Do you know anything about the, the Mars drive from IBM? Mars? Does, no. Does it ring a bell? You and Mark need to put this on your crazy list. It would store data on film and it would whip film out onto a spinning drum to read it. And then it would take the film off the drum and, and shove it back into this kind of... Was this the, the, the mass storage thing where they yes. have like just tons of these film strips? And yes, would... that's right. Hanging film strips, yeah. 
Yeah, I think I think the NSA was a big yes, big customer. That's right. I think for it was that. the NSA may have been the only customer, maybe. So, so yeah, people who know about these say they were terrible. Right. Well, but I wait a minute, I thought they were doing the best they could. I thought we were going to have this charitable view. You had inspired me with this charitable view towards like there, you know, everyone's just. Well, it was probably the best they could do, but it was slow and unreliable. And slow and unreliable. Mechanical yeah. nightmare, you know, moving these pieces of film back and forth. All right. We got to take another quick break. And then I want to come back and we want to ask you about some things you may see repeating themselves in the future. So we'll be back with more Ken Scherf on the metal. On the Metal is brought to you by the Oxide Computer Company. Take it from Paul Guaz. Just go to Oxide.computer. Let's please get back to the show. All right, we're back. Ken, one of the things, I, one question I got for you is, have you discovered things in these kind of historical machines that you thought would have new applicability given some of the changes in technology? So it's, it's hard to think of any sort of lost ideas I've discovered that really should be brought back. Oh, damn it. God, Jess, that was my, that was my that was my big plan. I this was <laughs> I thought well, you know we're gonna have Ken on the podcast. We're gonna discover some nugget, and then no, okay. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna say vacuum tubes. We really should go back to those right. that had so many advantages. But I just wonder if there are ideas where you're just like this idea. Okay, did not work when originally tried because we do see this where you like ideas were were kind of tried at an earlier time, and then the later process advances or what have you make something more viable than they once were. Well, you know, I think there's sort of the wheel of reincarnation in a lot of ways that you have things like computers being centralized and then being decentralized, becoming centralized again to the cloud. And you, you know, as you look over history, you see that there's been sort of a lot of cycles of this where things have been moving back and forth. Do you want all your data, all your computing in one place? Right. Or do you want it, you know, out in the cloud and you're using it remotely? It does seem to be the swinging pendulum between centralization and decentralization. Yeah, we've seen that a couple of times, I feel. Yeah. I mean, even in our own lifetimes, we've seen that, right? You know, people who think that the, the cloud is a new thing, you, know, you look in the 1970s, remote computing was, was becoming very popular. It was the compute utility, right? Isn't that what they called it? It's had so many names that, you know, I, I read these names, it's like, are you talking about something I know about or is this something entirely different? Right. So, so I, I, I think by looking at computer history, you realize that a lot of the ideas we think of as new really go back to the 1960s. You know, some of them are just becoming popular in new ways. You know, others were just not feasible back then, and now they are. Things like computer graphics, they were doing computer graphics in the 1960s, but when you have very little, limited memory, there's very little you can do. Right. Having a lot of memory in GPUs just solves so many problems for you. Right, right. You know, things that were hard problems then are now just trivial. Right, and things like virtualization, obviously done in the 60s, but then we, we yeah. through a long period where we didn't need to virtualize. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Virtualization is one of these ideas that keeps being reincarnated in new ways, moving from mainframes down into smaller computers. I figure it's only a matter of time till we're running, you know, virtualized phones. You can run different. Ooh, there you go, virtualized phones. Ah, you heard that it would first. be good for testing. Yeah, there you go. You could you know, have your your iPhone and your Android virtual machine on the same phone and. Oh, there you know, that the I, I did like the um you could use that to your virtual phone, you could use that to confound Google Maps to convince that there's a traffic jam. I saw the guy was took ninety phones and walked it in a wagon to convince yeah, Google that Maps. Was pretty really? Yeah, it was a traffic really? jam. Really? Yeah, it was pretty good. I thought it was a good just, idea. Just a couple of days ago. Just a couple of days ago, yeah. That was I thought it was good. For uh, ways or just Google Maps? You know, isn't are those the same thing? Didn't they oh they nope. bought it, right? Or no? All right. No, they bought it and they're also not the same thing. Well, okay. well I, I I used to work on Google Maps yeah. and and Google Maps and Waze sort of sat in the same building nearby and sometimes communicated with each other. But were they were they solving the same problem? You know, I'm sorry to be stupid here, but were they are they solving the same yeah, problem? They are. Does that stop companies from? No, of course not. Of course <laughs> not. Yeah, right. Of course not. Organizational dysfunction. What, what is the uh, what's the craziest thing on the list that you've got in front of you? Yeah. What's next for, for my my crazy yeah, project? Yeah, your crazy project list. What's the absolute craziest? Right now, I'm. I'm trying to emulate a Honeywell 1800 mainframe, this giant room filling computer. Okay. And the reason I want to do that is that we could then run the Apollo guidance computer assembler code on that simulation. And then we could compile the Apollo guidance computer software. Oh, so right now we can't compile it. Well, there is a compiler, but it's like a modern written one. It's not using the authentic real compiler. <laughs> and nice. if, if, if we, it's not artisan, it's not the actual, <laughs> right. 
And, and so the original compiler or assembler has some interesting features, like it will generate the files that were used for the core ropes to, to wire them. So the Apollo Guidance computer, the way they did their ROMs is they would physically wire through core memory cores. If you put a wire through the core, you get a one. If you put the wire around the core, you get a zero. That's cool. So, so your program is physically wired oh into, this, into this you know, module. That's so cool. <laughs> It's like sewing instructions. I mean, in terms of like, so you gotta have to like because it was actual like stitch this thing it was properly. the memory yeah. that like you could hand do. So, so they actually a lot of the a lot of the people working on the core ropes were women who worked in the sewing industry in Massachusetts and had the fine motor skills for doing this this wiring. Yeah, nice. wow, that must be really hard to go do. Interesting. And so you know, this had a lot of interesting results, such as you had to freeze your code several weeks in advance because it was being physically woven into the... Yeah, like you don't understand. Like, I already wove this. It's like, no, we always deploy into production. It's like, yeah, yeah no, I know, but actually... And, and the, the programmers, like, didn't like it because they wanted to do these last-minute bug fixes, but the managers were kind of happy that they couldn't do any last-minute bug fixes. Yeah, yeah. right. Because, <laughs> because this is a software that was being used to land Apollo on the moon. Right. Yeah. And so the, so the Honeywell 1800 is the machine that you want to emulate or restore? You want to emulate? I want to emulate. Okay. That's so what's, cool. the, what, what's, what's that machine about? So it's, it's this very weird machine. It's a 48-bit machine. One of its weird features is it has two program counters, and they can both go forwards or backwards. Whoa. Okay. They can, they have, what, okay, what does it mean to have two program counters? We're executing two instructions simultaneously? It was mostly used for subroutine calls. That, okay. That um, when you did, did a subroutine call, instead of putting your return address on the stack, you could just switch to a different program counter. Oh my God. Then when you're done with the subroutine, you just go back to your first program counter, which kind of makes sense. Yeah. Are you able to remain charitable when looking at an idea like that? I mean, were they doing the best they could? So I'm, I'm, a little I'm, crazy? I'm, I'm still at the point of trying to figure out why this is a good idea. <laughs> okay. God, God, I so admire this. Like, I mean, giving them the benefit of the doubt is nice, though. It's amazing, and, yeah. And they would also do things like they would be running code and then they'd switch to another program counter for just one instruction. So it's to basically reuse an instruction from some other part of the code to, to save on memory. And Ooh. so the control flow, it's just That's a nightmare. Brutal. It's just a nightmare trying to figure out what the control flow is in this program because you're jumping between two program counters, jumping back and forth. You know, I'm kind of judging that in my mind, and yet we often, not often, but we're known, do you know what instruction picking is on Spark? So you know Spark has got, you've got a delay slot on Spark, yeah. famously. And if in the delay slot you have a branch, it's called a DCTI couple. Mm -hmm. If you execute the target of the branch, of the initial branch, and then the program counter will immediately change to the target of the branch that's in the slot. The branch always annulled in the slot. So that has the effect of picking one instruction out of a bank of instructions. And I have done this. So and I feel proud of it. So that's what's wrong. I, this is why I'm glad you're charitable. So you're I'm glad, I hope the future Ken is charitable to the past me because... So hearing this, I think you'd like the Honeywell 1800. <laughs> that reminds me of something. Wait a minute. Speaking of technology <laughs> coming back around. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of, yeah, I, I, that feels like a value judgment that I'd like <laughs> to the Honeywell 1800. All right. But I knew I might, though. I'm kind of intrigued by this. This I think it's a terrible idea, and yet it's intri an intriguing idea. So, so then another crazy project I'm working on is um, the IBM 360 Model 50. Mark bought a console on for, for this computer. So, you know, th this is why these computer consoles with like all the blinking lights, like yeah. hundreds yes. and hundreds of lights and switches and everything. And so but we're, it, I'm right now I'm ready to confess to Ken that we've got one of those lights. We do. Right. So if you look right behind you, see that light right on the, on the top of the filing cabinet, oh, yeah. right. The ready button. Yeah. But I, but I feel like now I feel like, did we like scalp a machine effectively? Yeah. Well, if we ever need one of these, I know who to... Yeah, you know who to get to. Yeah, yeah we top. actually have two of them. Yeah. So it's just called two machines. But, but, but anyway, anyway, to get back yeah, to my sorry. story. So he has the console. We figured it'd be nice to have the lights blink. Yeah. I could stick Christmas tree lights back there and have it blink in a very nice way, but it wouldn't be accurate. So what I want to do is have the lights blink in a very accurate way, which means I have to implement an IBM 36050, which is a microcoded machine. So I'm busy rewriting the microcode engine to run actual 36050 instructions in the proper way. Wow. And so I have enough manuals that explain about 90% of what I need to know to make this work. To write the microcode. 
but there's these weird corner cases in the floating point engine that are a little hard to understand. We've tracked down somebody in, in Switzerland has the manual for the microcode and we're trying to convince them to scan it so I can then finish this project and then we just need to put it all into like an FPGA, build drivers for hundreds and hundreds of lights and then we can have the console blink in the accurate way. It had That's the console dope. blink in the actual, and you know, I don't know if it will be sufficiently appreciated how authentic the blinking of the lights no, it is. Will be. It, it will Please. be. Please. It will be. Please. Like this is authentic microcoded. Light, light blinking. That's, that is amazing. I, I, you know, people who are into this thing will look at restored consoles. It's like, oh, that blinking, that's just random. That's no good. That, yeah. that is not an actual, like, genuine microcode blinking. That is, that's great. And are you writing this from scratch, effectively? Writing the microcode from scratch? So, so basically, I'm writing the microcode engine in JavaScript for, for my first version. And then we'll, we'll put it all into an FPGA if it actually works and... So we can get more performance out of it. That's great. That's cool. Where do you even find one of those? This was on eBay. Oh, whoa. Okay. I didn't realize that. And how come everyone we have on this program finds Every great stuff on eBay? Hey, person. we found good no, stuff on eBay. I feel like whenever I go to eBay, it's crap. Nah, nah. Okay. What did you get on eBay? That's so awesome. The mugs. And the mugs are pretty good. So the Soyuz clock was not from eBay. That was from R&R &R Auctions, who, okay. who does a bunch of space auctions. Mm. Whoa. So, so they, I, that, okay. This is not a good idea for Jess to hear. I feel there's like, space auctions. Yeah, I know. Like this is not like you don't understand. Like we like we have to build a company together. We cannot have Jess spend her life savings <laughs> on R and R auctions or worse. Oh, like Steve, she's gonna have like Jess is gonna come in. Like I oh, figured I out what we did with our last round of fundraising. We have bought this nozzle <laughs> from. <laughs> <the> <laughs> <laughs> you say this so like it actually it's gonna happen. It feels so plausible <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah you can you can get lots of nozzles for like you know a couple thousand dollars oh. if you Sounds want cheap. oh no, uh, um, no. So, so the, steve we're gonna have to fundraise already than yeah, we thought we so I, I can hook you up with a guy oh no you're a name <laughs> so, maybe so, in like a year so, exactly. so the, the apollo guidance computer i was restoring this belongs to this guy jimmy Locke in texas who in the 1970s bought two tons of space scrap from a, a junkyard in Houston and found the Apollo guidance computer in with that scrap. Jimmy. That's cool. Wow, that like, was how amazing. much does that go for in an auction? So our yeah, our, our, our auction sold one a few months ago for um, about $350,000. Okay. okay. Glad you cooled on that that's one. No, <laughs> that's a scary number because that number is a lot of money and yet it is like less money than we have raised. So you may not spend a not raise that. on a crazy. guidance computer. That is crazy. Okay. Like that's serious. Please, I'm not that crazy. We're going to need like a uh, space okay. intervention. If it was like 3K, I'd be like, ooh, maybe questioning well, it. Well, seen that before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yikes. This is, th this conversation took a turn for the dangerous. <laughs> hey, you're the one who brought it up. Let's so, stick to eBay and the eBay budget limits. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so yeah, you could have like a really nice collection of stuff in your office if you want it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, god. oh god oh god we're gonna have a space nozzle we're gonna have a no, no we just have some silicon wafers that's the silicon wafers again those are 40 dollars you, you did you did buy silicon wafers. Yeah, you get 20 pack. for 40 dollars that yeah, is actually pack. really a good deal that is a good deal 20 for 40 so you, we are gonna hang up wafers we're yeah. gonna do that yeah. and then well, the fishing gonna, wire was like a dollar we are not hanging them up i, I am task I am. no Boy, you're this, not no. this plan is like far along i had no yeah. idea okay that's, this is sorry so, jess wants to get a scissor lift which she herself wants to get on, yeah. go up 30 feet and hang silicon wafers yeah. in the we rafters. We measured it's 12. It's 12. 12 feet. So if, if you wanted me to take a look at your silicon wafers first under the microscope and give you some dye photos and tell you about them, I can oh, do that. Okay, yeah, we should do we're that. Actually, yeah, that. We are actually like building a computer company. We're not just hanging up wafers. That's on true. That's I, just, I don't want to get tipping over I don't want to give you the wrong impression, but that said, we are, so we were inspired by, we had uh, Mir Michael on the podcast and he grew up in Foster City. Dad worked for AMD, and he used to put wafers up on his wall, which I thought so was, like that was that's, that's pretty, pretty so cool. We're, we're pretty cool. That. Where are you getting these wafers from? I guess eBay. We'll, eBay. All right. Yeah. So yeah, we'll have to get Ken to put them under the uh, under the microscope. Would you mind? Would you? I'd be delighted. All right. Yeah. That's that's great. Do you find that like the just in general that the, the the retro computing guides you at all in terms of like the future? I mean, do you does it feel forward looking or does it feel merely antiquarian? Well, you know, I, I would like to say something about how looking at retrocomputing can inspire people for yeah. the future and all this. But 
Really, I just do it because I think it's cool. <laughs> I think, no, no, I, but I think it does inspire me because I think I think, it, so. I think it is actually been really inspiring to look at the stuff that you have done. It is inspiring because it reminds people that the hardware still exists. There is still a hardware software interface and the, the stuff is still out there. Well, the thing I like about the retro computing is it's an era of computers where you can actually understand what's going on. You know, modern computers, you look inside, it's you know, a few mystery chips. The chips are so complicated, nobody can understand them. But with you know a computer like the 1401, I can look at a particular transistor and say, this is the transistor that's causing the problem with addition. If we replace this transistor, now addition yeah. will be fixed. We also have the, the issue of, honestly, just speeds. I mean, that's the challenge on modern computing. The speeds are so high that you can't just... You can't understand uh, what's going on because the equipment is such high speed. And, and there's just so many layers of software. So many layers of software, yeah, yeah. With, with old computers, you can look at the software and you can you can understand everything, basically everything that's going on. I have to say, this is part of what I love about, I mean, you mentioned Risk Five earlier, Jess. It's it so is much fun about Risk Five. It, it is. It, it, it feels very like, it, in retro is the wrong word, but it feels, it harkens back to an era when you can you could understand much more about the machine. So one of the things we're doing at Oxide is uh, developing what are borderline microcontrollers, but effectively for the service processor, hardware router trust. And we're actually operating within pretty small amounts of RAM and ROM. And it does feel like the retrocomputing stuff is actually relevant. And actually it was funny, you know, one of our, our engineers said, actually, you know what? 640K is actually enough for anybody <laughs> because at the levels we are at, 640K, you can do a lot in 640K. So I think it's, it's like the stuff is actually still retains its relevance for sure. Well, and the other part about re retro computing I like is that I feel like I'm helping preserve some history that would otherwise be yes, lost. Absolutely. That there's a, a lot of old computers that really nobody knows about them. You know, they have very important historical value, things like the data point 2200 leading to where we are today. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, computers like that, that I think should be better known. And I think it's better known even when they are, even almost especially when they were exploring different ideas that didn't pan out. It's valuable, like the multiple PC idea on the Honeywell 1800. I mean, it's like, that's, it's important to understand that. And that's interesting. And, and I do, I feel exactly the same way. I was, part of the reason I ended up, I started buying old manuals when I was younger was because I was concerned that they were going to be destroyed. And I think a lot of stuff is, does get destroyed. Well, you know, there's, there's people out there who are doing a lot of work to, keep old manuals, scan them, put them up on bit savers. So there is a lot of effort to keep these manuals from getting lost, which I think is important. And if someone's interested in getting involved in retro computing, what's a, what's a good way to, to kind of start messing around with this stuff? So come by the Computer History Museum, come, come by on a Wednesday when we're working on the 1401, talk to people there. That's, that's one way to get involved. Computer History Museum, this is in Mountain View. Mountain View, California. If you get the chance, it is a great museum. It is so much fun. If you are, if, your life takes you at all to Silicon Valley, plot out some time for the, the Computer History Museum. The 1401 has demos running on Wednesdays and Saturdays, so if you want to punch a card, see it run through the computer. I did that. Oh, that is me. I kind of did. <laughs> well, and, and, then, and then also, what's you went to the Living Computer Museum, right? Is that in that? No, seems, I haven't been to that one. I want to go. Uh, yeah, okay, I've not been to that one. So, so that, that one's in Seattle, and so it, it has a very different um, focus than the Computer History Museum. The Living Computer Museum, they basically want to get all their computers up and running and have people able to sit down in front of them and and use them. That's really neat. As opposed to the Computer History Museum, where it's most of the computers are just static exhibits, just the 1401 just and the, the PDP are, are yeah. ones that are, are operational. So, you know, the Living Computer Museum, they have computers from, you know, 70s, 80s, 60s that you can actually just sit down and start typing if you want the you know, old school Unix experience, you can do that. That's great. Well, that's a great way for people to get involved. I think a lot of people are. I, I think retro computing is a great way, honestly, to get people involved in actual computing and, and not actual computing. Because that's, that's, <laughs> that sounds pejorative. Let me, uh, real computing. Real computing. No, but no, I know it, it actually, I think it's a great way to, to remind people again of this hardware software interface and that people, we are still doing work at the hardware software interface and that if, one gets excited by some retro computing. That's great. And if you want to get excited by computing that's being done today at the hardware software interface, there's plenty to get involved in. Well, Ken, thank you so much for, for coming. Thanks for being here. Oh, this, is, this has been a lot and of fun. And for the promise of silicon wafer instruction later. <laughs> well, well, thank you for inviting me here. This, this was fun. Yeah, I can almost forgive you for introducing just the idea R &R. of R&R <laughs> space auctions. That's super which, 
when the company is ruined, it's going to be with jet <laughs> nozzles, but it, uh, it'll be a good way to go. But Ken, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ken. You've been listening to On the Metal, Tales from the Hardware Software Interface. For show notes, to learn more about our guests, or to sign up for our mailing list, visit us at onthemetal.fm. On the Metal is a production of Oxide Computer Company and is recorded in the Oxide Garage in Oakland, California. To learn more about Oxide, visit us at oxide.computer. On the Metal is hosted by me, Brian Cantrell, along with Jess Frizzell, and we are frequently joined by our boss, Steve Tuck. Our original and awesome theme music is by J.J. Wiesler at Pollen Music Group. You can learn more about J.J. and Pollen at pollenmusicgroup.com. We are edited and produced by Chris Hill and his crew at HumblePod. From Jess, from Steve, from me, and from all of us at Oxide Computer Company, thanks for listening to On the Metal.